This is Think Tech Hawaii, Community Matters. Good afternoon. We're here for All About Leadership, a show where we examine people who've really gotten insights from their work in technology, business, hospitality. We have a guest today, Eric Heenan, whom I've known for many, many years, and we will talk about that. And he's back in Hawaii, and I think that many CEOs of the Hawaii Business Magazine 250 firms would really find his experiences and insights into leadership quite exciting and interesting. And we have uh, Eric beside me, and we're going to say welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and good to see you again. Yes, and we go way back, and, but tell me, you were born and raised where? I was born on the mainland oh. in upstate New York, uh, but we moved here when I was about a year old. So I was uh, raised out in Hawaii Kai, and then moved to a town, uh, I think, when I was about eight years old. Okay, yeah. okay. And, 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 and uh, you went to uh, college on the mainland? Yes, I went to UCLA, yeah, where I was a Japanese major. And I also spent one year abroad in Nagoya, um, oh. you know, studying up on Japanese. Now, yeah. now, and it was a Nanzan. Nanzan, okay, yes, that's yes, quite famous yes. Uh, for a, a great school <clears throat> right. uh, for teaching Japanese. I wish I went there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's look at your kind of lifelong interest in right. Japanese, sure. and language, culture. Where did it begin? Right. And where can you say, wow, that's where I kind of, it triggered my interest right. and that carried me through my life. Where, where sure. did that happen? Well, so I think just growing up in Hawaii, there are many Japanese Americans here, obviously. Uh, my friends growing up, you know, many of them had really nice looking bentos. So I was always interested in the food uh, aspect of Japanese culture. Um, then probably in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, when all the Japanese, it was the bubble right. period, and they started buying up all the expensive real estate in town. And then I just thought back then, hey, why not study the language and, and see if I can become some kind of businessman, oh. uh, you know, and um, be a connection to So you were looking Japan. ahead even back in the 80s. I was, okay. a little bit, yeah. And, and when did, where, where did you start studying Japanese first? Right, so first started at Iolani oh. in uh, seventh grade. And luckily, we had uh, two school trips to Japan, um, I think after my freshman year and after my junior year. And, you know, Japanese is a pretty tough language, especially the, the reading and writing. And, you know, I wasn't, I was about a C student before those two school trips. And then once I came back from those school trips, I was really motivated. And, you know, after that, you know, it was kind of, I became a better student and uh, really kind of um, committed myself to studying the language. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, um, you are attracted, of course, to the language, right. to communicate and talk to each other. What are the things about Japan and the right. culture that sure. said, wow, that, that's really exciting. I, I, I want to delve more into that. Sure. Well, you know, my impression of Japan back then was the big cities. Mm -hmm. And so that I think the first time we went out to the countryside and I saw how beautiful a place it was, I was really blown away and it just totally surprised me. Um, you know, where there was the beaches or you know, Kyoto with all the temples, um, that fascinated me. And the second thing was going around towns, uh, wh wherever it was in Japan. And when we told people we were from Hawaii, they got really, really excited. And, uh, and I thought that was quite strange. And um, so I, I saw their love affair with Hawaii way back then. And, you know, it just felt really warm and welcoming. And so I thought, hey, why not go back there? That's fantastic. You know, even today, uh, there's probably more than 600 to 700,000 people in Japan who study the hula and, right. and, and the Hawaiian music. Right. So there's an extensive community. And yes. of course, the linkages with Hawaii go before the war and, and throughout uh, recent history. Now, uh, you were in uh, Nagoya for about, yes. what, six months? About uh, 10 months. 10 months, yep. wow. Yes. Now, Nagoya also has a distinct accent so that's kind of, uh, not quite Kansai <laughs> right. and not quite Tokyo right. but uh, you didn't adopt the accent at all I did not but no. my, my homestay father he oh. had quite a uh, you know Nagoya yeah ben. pronounced uh, oh, accent oh, yeah really? it still has it and now, now after um, uh, graduating from UCLA yep. what did you do yeah so I went straight back actually to Japan um, with a joint venture of a retail supermarket oh, company wow. 
And so this was a Japanese firm uh, with a Hong Kong-based uh, British firm, and they were opening this uh, retail uh, chain. Uh, I had worked there part-time during college, um, one of the summers there. And you know it was quite difficult to get a job, say with Toyota or Sony from Los Angeles, but this company was kind enough to you know sponsor my visa and uh, bring me back to to Japan. So you had some time, a period where you were actually working in an all Japanese language office. Yes, Am I correct. <laughs> That's correct. What was yeah. that like? Yeah, it was fascinating. So so to be clear, I wasn't in the office. Right. I was actually oh. in the supermarket. Oh wow! And so <laughs> yeah, so a lot of people were surprised. They said, "Oh, you went to UCLA," but uh, that could, that was probably the best thing that could have mm -hmm. happened to me because I really learned a lot about you know the daily lives of Japanese people. You know how they shop, how they interact mm -hmm. with each other, and you know I think within six months my Japanese was, pre was pretty <laughs> decent. Right? Yes. Yeah. So you were in the trenches. Yeah, I was uh, right in the trenches. Directly yeah. uh, the point of sale almost. Yes. Uh, working with Japanese consumers. Consumers yes. in, a, in a, a supermarket setting, yes. and that's unbelievable right. for a immersion of, right. of the uh, of uh, a great in-depth experience. Right. Uh, and, and what happened after that? And, right. and I know we're leading into uh, sure. how you ended up uh, in Japan for many years. Right. Uh, so if you can give a shortcut, how uh, what events uh, propelled you to eventually live in Japan for a period of time? Yeah, sure. Well, so I, I had some friends uh, working in Tokyo, and so my goal, you know. I was kind of slaving away at the supermarket an hour north of Tokyo, and I really wanted to, you know, move down to Tokyo and work for one of these big global companies. And uh, through a, a Hawaii connection, who was I think working at Microsoft or one of those companies, he got me a job in IT as a you know entry level salesperson. Um, I had no tech technical right. background, right. but my only skill was that I could speak Japanese, right, right, right. and that sort of launched me onto a, a sales career in the uh, technology space. And, and, and how many years uh, uh, cumulative did you spend in Tokyo? After? To in Tokyo, total almost 20 years, wow. but in technology sales, about 15. Wow. Yeah. And, and of course, in Japan, uh, you know that I, I lived and worked in yes. Japan for 20 years also, and was in the tech area. We call that a uh, uh, segment the gaishke, right. Right? Uh, companies who yeah. are from abroad. And of course, they all have problems sure. you know, selling into the Japanese market right. through Japanese corporations or to Japanese consumers. Right. Any takeaways from your you know, experiences working with gaishke, trying to get them to sell to Japanese companies right. or, or consumers because of your unique ability to see both sides right. or talk to both sides, where many gaishke big wigs uh, uh, do not speak Japanese. Sure. Uh, any anything, any insights there? Right. So the the first big company I worked at was Cisco Systems, and I think they did it the traditional way in terms of partnering with large Japanese companies. And so all of these Japanese whole, you know distributors, they get very nervous when an American or European uh, manufacturer comes to town because they think they're going to take all of their business. Mm. Um, and Japanese consumers, whether it's Sony or Mazda, those big companies, they also want to they would prefer to buy through the Japanese oh, distributor right. rather than directly from a Cisco or a Oracle and so you know what I learned from Cisco was in the early days um, so a lot of the partners and clients were both very um, you know just skeptical and and hesitant to, to deal with us mm. because they thought we were trying to do it the American way uh, okay, um, right. but, well well in fact they were doing it you know the, the normal Japanese way was to build up a channel business mm. And um, that was very smart. And you know, I think I joined that company um, when they had maybe 200 people, and probably two years later they had a, a thousand people. So the growth and you know business was uh, tremendous. Now, I, I also um, did sales in Japan right. and, and marketing. Uh, and one of the things I learned, and maybe you can add to this, is that uh, many times Japanese uh, companies uh, would buy not on price but on relationship <laughs> sure is that true that's very true yeah, yeah. so uh, one of our biggest uh, partners in Japan uh, they're called net one systems and it took me you know honestly it took me almost two years to forge that relationship mm. with their sales team and they had uh, connections with all these large customers so I wanted to get on their good side uh, to expand my business and you know I you know, it's like the old um, saying with Japanese, you have to kind of take them to dinner and buy them a few beers or sakes. And it, it took literally two years. And once I, you know, I think we, we went to a nice dinner and had some drinks, from that point on, I was accepted and, and I was their kind of right-hand man. But it took a long time. It was very frustrating. <laughs> 
But once they yeah. signed up and yeah. they saw you as a trusted uh, supplier or seller, yes. that relationship flourished and continued. It did, yes. And, you know, um, they, they saw that, uh, one, I wasn't going to go back to the States mm -hmm. anytime soon, that I was uh, really committed to Japan, that I spoke Japanese. Um, it is difficult, say, when it's a more senior person, an expat who comes right. in, they don't speak any Japanese. Um, their contract is probably for two years maximum. Right. So the, the Japanese, you know, they don't want to commit too much of their time mm -hmm. knowing that person's probably going to be gone in, in a year or two. Now, what did you like working in a Japanese office? And right. I have another question after right. that. What did you not like? Right. <laughs> what did I like? You know, the teamwork was, was really amazing there. Um, I think they, they take orders very well. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's a lot less conflict there. Um, but they really work together to get the job done. Um, and they don't complain a lot. <laughs> they just kind of do it. Like, You're talking about teamwork. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that we're trying to yeah. uh, foster even Google, I think, prizes, right. uh, values collaboration right. uh, uh, over tech sometimes, right. as you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's really true. Is that from the culture, Japanese culture? How pe or is it through education? Where, where does that come from for uh, Japanese uh, employees? I think it starts in the, the school system where everything is about like the team rather than the individual, you know, whether it's a Japanese baseball or oh, a softball right. or volleyball, they're, they're really strong at, I think, those team sports, and it, it carries on throughout college and then, you know, when they get to the workforce. You know, often these big companies, they will hire, you know, hundreds or thousands of new college right. grads, and so from their first moment in the office, they're kind of together with their new family, who they're supposed to be working uh, together for the next maybe 10, 20, 30 years. And, and of course, we are very near that time, April 1st. Right, when, <laughs> yes. When they all come in, and yeah. you're correct that uh, they're giving, uh, I don't want to say the word indoctrination, right. but, a, but a clear uh, invitation to join right. uh, the organization. And there's a much longer uh, training period right. uh, in Japanese companies compared to almost uh, none right. <laughs> in U.S. Sure. companies. Yeah. And I think that's a different kind of uh, molding development of employees. Right. Uh, so, but uh, my second question, mm. what did you not like? Right. You know, I think there is some still discrimination against foreigners. Uh, I certainly thought there was a, a ceiling on how high I could go in the organization. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why I went back to business school. Because, you know, I was doing pretty well in sales, but there was no sign of, you know, making that next jump, you know, whether it's a manager or whatnot. Um, that's probably my number one, you know, uh, take on that. Now, you went to an uh, MBA uh, program at Vanderbilt. That's correct. correct, yes. Now, now uh, what made you go there? And, right. and, and what uh, <laughs> are the takeaways you learned there that you right. brought back to Japan? Sure. So I, I chose Nashville because I, I didn't want to go to a New York or a San Francisco. I didn't want to go to another huge city. Oh, right, right, right. I wanted a more, a little <laughs> bit smaller out. place. Yeah, um, kind, of, kind of hang out there yeah. for a while. Yeah. And so I was looking at um, kind of a little bit smaller schools. Um, I was really torn between there and North Carolina. And it just, when I had a campus visit to, mm -hmm. to Nashville, and it was, it was just a really warm uh, environment. I kind of, I like the South. It reminds me of home a oh, bit. Right, yeah, right. they're very friendly and just very warm people. So We'll get back to that. Okay. And I want to hear more about your great experiences in the South and, right. and those takeaways for global business. And this is Ray Tuchiyama, and we'll be back in a few minutes. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time.
We're back to All About Leadership with our guest, Eric Heenan of Alakai Search, the president and founder. He's been talking to us about his very vibrant, in-depth experiences in Japan. And now we're in the South, where he mm. goes to get an advanced business degree. And uh, tell me a little bit more about Vanderbilt. Right. So Vanderbilt was a, a really you know, fascinating school, a smaller school. Um, I really enjoyed the city there. Uh, one of the factors also I went there was uh, Nissan oh, right. had moved their global headquarters right. from Los Angeles to Nashville, oh, uh, right. probably right. for tax reasons. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, so, you know, my, my dream was to get a job with Nissan <laughs> okay. after graduation. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, but that was my intention to go work for Nissan and uh, work in Nashville for two years, wow. then get sent back to yeah, yeah, Tokyo yeah, as an expat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't turn out that yeah, way. No, but, no, but it's a good, good plan. But but I, I had a plan. But it's interesting you say that because uh, uh, Bill Haggerty, the current ambassador to right. Japan, is from Tennessee. Yes, he is. And he was very uh, much part of the attracting more Japanese investment right. to Tennessee. And, and Nissan, of course, came to Smyrna right. uh, first off. And now they're all over the place. Yeah, probably. sure. And, and in Nashville and, and uh, all the cadets, you know, right. uh, vendors are all there, the sure. suppliers. And that's why Nashville has uh, suddenly blossomed with Japanese restaurants too. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because of that. So uh, you go back to Japan after right. Vanderbilt. Yes. And, and then what did you do there? So initially I was working with Apple in uh, marketing. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, a great experience. It was the launch of the iPhone. So I was actually in Cupertino for, right, for right. that. Uh, learned some, you know, marketing um, tricks from Steve Jobs, and it was a good uh, experience. Uh, I was still looking, I guess, to do something different, maybe in the startup world. Right, right. And so after Apple, uh, I teamed up with a couple of close friends of mine who were career recruiters, and I was a career salesperson. Right. And you know, I thought, why, why not go into business with them right. since I have connections in the technology sector? And that was, you know, the next uh, two years I spent working in a, a startup uh, recruiting. And that, uh, of course, would uh, uh, make you, uh, you know, even more, um, uh, I guess, in depth in the business world. Right. Adding the IT and the recruiting, right. uh, leadership, uh, kind of, uh, kind of all together. Uh, tell me about the world of recruiting in Japan. Sure. And now you're recruiting mostly, uh, I would think, for gaishke or uh, for uh, multinationals Correct. in Japan. Correct. Yes. And, uh, and what kind of uh, what kind of roles and 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 what kind of skills were you looking for at right. that at that point? At that point, so we were we're hiring mainly for uh, salespeople, also senior level consultants for uh, candidates from say Accenture and those types of companies. And also, you know, senior technical people. Maybe it was some marketing directors or those types of. And where did candidates. it come from? Did it come globally? Did it come right. from the U.S., Ireland, Australia, U.K., yep. Canada? Where did it come from? Ninety-nine percent of them would be Japanese, bilingual Japanese. Oh, okay. Yeah, so very few foreigner okay. uh, candidates. And, and the Japanese, uh, how do they? Uh, uh, become bilingual, or what right. kind of skill sets did they acquire uh, sure. through a Japanese education, and from then, what happened to them? Right. Uh, so, so some of them would, would spend a year or two um, in college uh, in the States or in Canada, and then some of them, just through working at a foreign company, would pick up the language. Um, I think there, yeah, there were a few that, that could pick up English just on their own, right, but right. Th those were very, I think, yeah. rare cases. That's really rare. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so the Gaishke uh, in, in Japan mm. uh, want, uh, of course, individuals who could really interact and communicate right. with a Japanese customer, yes. plus pick up the phone and call Boston or New York or Ex uh, San Francisco exactly. and, and interact with the home headquarters. And exactly. that, those are the very basic uh, skill sets that we're looking for. Yes, exactly. So uh, in this world of recruiting, uh, what did you learn about right. Japanese uh, uh, themselves and, right. and, and the companies and, and, and the leadership of these companies? Any, any takeaways of that world? Sure. You know, they have various uh, techniques on, you know, their interviews and their interview processes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Amazon, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly what oh, they right. used to do, but they had some very unique right. ways of interviewing candidates. Um, you know, they were known for being very tough, but also, you know, they would get the best candidates. Um, there are other, other companies that were more traditional, right. and it might take a much longer time to, to bring in candidates. Hmm. Um, but yeah, no, they, just in terms of getting talent, it's so, so competitive right. there, because any single tech company that's in Silicon Valley is also has a presence normally 
in Tokyo, and there's you know 10 million plus candidates. So so they can all you know they're all on yeah. many of them are on the market. Now, what's changed is maybe 10 years ago, uh, engineers specifically were not uh, changing jobs. Mm. It was the salespeople right, who right. wanted more commission, and right. they would change. But nowadays, yeah. um, the engineers have caught on that right. if they go from one hot startup to another, yeah. they can get more stock options and an increase in. Um, you know, salary and so that's a dramatic change a in the uh, recruiting change. world yeah. in Japan. Yeah. And, you know, I used to work for Google. Of course, yes. Google had a, a uh, very, very uh, complex <clears throat> set of questions. Right. <laughs> that's uh, in their own category. Uh, so you came back to Hawaii. Yes. Uh, uh, when did you come back? We came back last August. Okay. Yeah. And why? Why? Why now? Uh, you know, uh, right. uh, Olympics is coming up, 2020. <laughs> sure. You know, a lot of hiring going on in Tokyo. Right. Why? Why? Uh, that time uh, right. of, of your life to return to Hawaii? Yeah, so it's a good question. A combination of three things. Uh, the first uh, being I was there for 20 years, and so I'd, I'd always wanted to come home right. probably from about 10 years ago. Uh, the second, uh, my parents are you know getting right. a bit older, right. of course. and um, you know I really wanted uh, to be closer to them and, and be able to support them you know if they have some health issues. And third, we have a son who just turned five in December, and so the, the timing was really right. ideal you know to get him immersed in a, you know English speaking you know school and, and get his language. And, and up. all those uh, family personal reasons are the best of reasons right. to come back to Hawaii. But yeah. the next question is. You must uh, be coming back with all kinds of insights to uh, Hawaii Business mm. uh, Magazine 250 CEOs right. here in Hawaii, in the Hawaii market, sure. which, which is uh, not Tokyo. It's right. 1.2 million people right, yes. uh, living here. <laughs> That's like one ward, right. <laughs> a Shibuya ward in uh, Shinjuku in, in Tokyo. And uh, there aren't that many global things happening uh, in Hawaii, not right. as much as in, in Tokyo or Shanghai, Beijing sure. and so forth. But this is still a vibrant economy here. Right. And uh, people are dealing with uh, ways to grow, sure. uh, ways to lead organizations. What do you bring? Uh, if right. you could uh, meet Mr. CEO of sure. uh, Hawaii Business 250, what would you tell me right. what uh, you're bringing to search and, and yeah. uh, leadership in Hawaii? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the first thing, that, which is obvious, because I've been in Asia for 20 years, so I have a network of, of talent and a candidate pool, which I think is much different than the, tip, than the other recruiters in town. So I think a lot of recruiters, they have a great network here. They probably have a very strong network on the mainland. Um, I'm hoping to, to get there one day, but what I have today is a, a large network um, in Asia. And a lot of these, um, there's two types of candidates. One, there's many uh, Hawaii locals working in Asia, you know, like myself. And there's the other, um, you know, it might be a British person, it might be someone from China, but um, I think there is cultural uh, symmetry between, say, people who can survive in Hong Kong or Tokyo and then coming to Hawaii uh, versus that candidate who maybe comes from Chicago or Wisconsin. And so I'm uh, advising some of these CEOs, hey, take a look at senior level candidates or mid-level candidates from Asia because they can probably, you know, I think their stick rate in Hawaii would be a little bit higher. When you say stick stick rate, uh, you know we're all familiar with people from the mainland. They come here, they think they're on vacation, and return to the mainland two yeah, years later, or, sure. or even uh, less. Right. Uh, and you're referring to people who are, have survived in ethnically diverse communities, exactly. so, uh, in Tokyo, or Shanghai, right. or Hong Kong, yeah. or, or uh, Singapore, and right. they're uh, used to many languages, exactly. uh, religions, uh, cultures, food, and yes. so forth and uh, how people think are right. quite different than, yes. than in Chicago and New York. Is right. that, is, are those the points that you want to kind yes. of uh, 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 present to people, yeah. the CEOs here? That's correct. Um, I mean, these are the outliers, right? Mm -hmm. These are the people that they were probably brought up halfway around the world, but for some reason they decided to hang out in Tokyo or Hong Kong for 15 years, and they got married there, they had kids there. Um, because of the geographic uh, proximity to Hawaii, a lot of these candidates have been to Hawaii many times. A lot of them own property here. So I had a candidate from Singapore who came in for some interviews, and you know, he has property here. I have uh, numerous other candidates that are in the same situation. So I think their willingness to actually um, to thrive here and stay here is, is pretty good. And would you say that if you place these people you know, in these organizations, right. in Hawaii, local right. organizations, what effect do you think 
will change business right. in Hawaii. Uh, sure. That you're, you're be becoming like a change agent in a kind of <laughs> secretive way, right. bringing people from the outside, right. but still uh, people who can fit in to right. organizations and to culture in Hawaii. Yeah. How do you see business changing, you think, right. because of what you do? Well, I just think, you know, Hawaii's always been a, a great place, very open to outside uh, talent, you know, and, you know, my father's an example, and I think it doesn't, we don't care where the person's from as long as they're willing to contribute to the team and, and hopefully stay, right? That's been the big issue, I think, for a lot of people is they come, they might make a contribution, but then they take off after a year or two. Right. And so, you know, I really want to, you know, focus on people that are, um, you know, committed to mm. staying long term. You know, it always it right. doesn't work out, unfortunately. Right. But um, and these people, they can bring a, a, I think, a fresh perspective to businesses. Maybe um, they come from even a different industry. Mm. But somebody from banking right. doesn't necessarily mean they can't work in another industry. You know, they bring a, a new perspective on on things. Well, I think that's that's fantastic. I think uh, what you're doing is, uh, I think, globalizing Hawaii. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. We always talk about Hawaii as a bridge to Asia. Now sure. you're doing something, bringing people from Asia right. <laughs> to act uh, and to really educate and train uh, people locally who may be able to take on global and, and you know, uh, APAC kind of uh, uh, marketing and, and skills in the future. So sure. this is fantastic. Eric, we are running out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it, that was that went quickly. It went quickly, but it was really great. And I hope you can yeah. join us, you know, in the future to great. give us more insights as you kind of uh, uh, evolve okay. and, and um, succeed in this in this market. What you've learned, because in my case, hmm. you know, uh, you can go home again, right. but it's different. Yes, <laughs> it is. Hawaii is different, and right. it, ha it, it, it it itself has evolved in many sure. ways. This is Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, all about leadership, and we thank you for your viewing of this uh, segment, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.